made the web available to all comers. Those are the things America did when it was successful. One other point I want to make is America was always a battle. It was never a straight line to doing the right thing. It could have done better. It could have made those public investments I'm talking about that made it so successful. It could have made them earlier, more aggressively, but there was always resistance. Was, were there mistakes made? Were, were there wrong roads put in? Was there waste in government? Sure. But that's not good enough reason to say we don't need government to keep going. The ideological shift is the main problem we now face. For one moment, I thought maybe we had returned to Keynesian post-depression economics. Uh, Keynesianism wasn't all we needed. We needed serious public investment. For one moment, people like uh, Phil Angelides, who ran the uh, Financial Crisis uh, Commission, um, said, why? Why did we suddenly revert to this idea that we needed austerity, that we couldn't spend, that we couldn't use government? My view is that, uh, that the revolution of the 1970s and 1980s, the conservative revolution, was too successful, was too strong. My view is also the economics profession never fully adopted the Keynesian revolution. I'm writing a book about that now. They never fully came to believe. They basically believed and the self-adjusting economy. Uh, uh, so it's a little, it's hard for me to be an optimist. I, I saw Joe Stiglitz on TV the other day, and he said, well, of course I'm an optimist. And then he gave some, you know, maybe it's better if we're not optimistic, maybe we'll begin to do the right thing and make the hard decisions and make the tough choices. Maybe we'll begin to recognize, hey, we are walking near the edge, and we better get our act together. And think how often that is what provoked the US to do the right thing, from Pearl Harbor on forward. A sense of insecurity, a sense of walking the edge, a sense of fighting the battle, a sense of looking into uncertainty and acting anyway, instead of being told by politicians, I know exactly what we have to do. Don't worry, it won't make you too uncomfortable. We're going to forge ahead. But that was the story of America, and that was the story of American government. I'm going to stop here and answer three questions very quickly. Is Social Security going bankrupt? <laughs> no. It's utter nonsense to say that Social Security is going bankrupt. Under the, if we do nothing about Social Security, we will... Thank you, Chuck. I know you've got to go teach, and I promised him by 5.30, but you see how, uh, how difficult it is for me to stop talking. Very good. Me too. Carry on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, e even if we make no changes, the best guess about Social Security is it will pay three quarters of its benefits, two thirds of three quarters of its benefits. Why are people talking about Social Security? Why does the media bank going bankrupt? Why does the media say that there was a question about one it? In one of the debates, we all know that Social Security is going backward, and the people in the debate didn't counteract that. Don't take it. Don't tolerate those kinds of distortions. Do high taxes cause slow growth? There is no economic data that will prove that high tax rates cause slow economic growth. You just can't do it. The best work is done by John Bakia and Joel Slemrod. Read their book. Don't listen to me. They're serious mainstream economists, use mainstream methodology. The people who say high income taxes, slow economic growth because they reduce incentives and reduce capital investment are distorting the data and the empirical research. And number three, does big government slow economic growth? Peter Linder did the best book on this, Growing Public. Linder, Ucal, Davis, another mainstream economist, tells me I used to be a conservative, I thought. But the profession, the economics profession, has moved so far he finds himself on the liberal side of the fence. There is no evidence that nations with bigger governments grow any more slowly than nations with smaller governments, or vice versa. Just no darn evidence. The reasons are a little complicated. We could go into them in the Q&A. 
I should probably leave it open for the Q&A. <clears throat> what do we do now, Sarah? Q&A. Huh? Q&A. Okay. Q&A it is, and I promise to keep the answer short. All right, so we're going to open it up for questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Madrick. I appreciate uh, your speech. Uh, my question is, um, I know you see the problem from the inside. Is there any possibility that the U.S. is really running away from the colonial uh, influence of the British? Because everything I see in the U.S. is really very different. The laws are different. The system of government is different. Is it possible psychologically that the U.S. does not want to look anything close to the British that come as them. I don't think I, you know, I'm not quite sure of all the subtleties of your question. Uh, I, did, I do think we renounced a lot about Britain, but I think we also retain very strong ties to Britain, not least the language. I'd say... Yeah. Using the British system, Canada and the US, they have, um, you know, they have, they use the government to do a lot of things. Uh, I see, you're talking about a welfare state. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think Britain is somewhere in between the continental Europe and ourselves. So, in some ways, we're alike, but yeah, they have a national health service, as we know. They uh, do have, a, I think, a, by and large, a better safety net than we do. They are running away from it a little bit themselves. They have adopted a kind of U.S. economic model. Um, but I don't think we're running towards that model in any, any significant way. I'm not sure I fully understand your question. Uh, we still uh, are more or less in terms of, one way of measuring that is ta total taxes collected as a percent of GDP, state, local, state, local, and federal taxes. And we're about at the bottom of the OECD, OECD list of 38, I think it's 38 countries. We collect maybe at the moment 25% of GDP on taxes. It's a recessionary period or a slow growth period. So it's low. The, the average in the OECD is 35%, so they collect a lot more taxes. And they don't have that big military budget. So they spend, it, especially in the continental countries, on uh, pre k systems. I'm pretty good, not universally good, but pretty good education system. Often on free university, but at least subsidized university. And most important, uh, uh, either cheap or free high quality healthcare systems. I just don't think we're getting there. And uh, it, I just, it, you know, I don't think we're moving in that direction. I'm a fan of Obamacare for what it's worth, but we can talk about that. Uh, and I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards, because I'm afraid I don't fully really understand what you asked. How are we going to create more jobs? The most important question there is. One is uh, old-fashioned fiscal stimulus next year, which we're probably not going to get, but we need a heck of a lot of it. We've got to spend like crazy. Most of that spending should be directed towards infrastructure investment and aid to state and local governments who are cutting back jobs like crazy. I was uh, last week in the town San Bernardino in uh, California, which went bankrupt. Can't believe that. You know, it's hard to believe. I'm not that familiar with the so-called inland empire of California, but boy, was I remiss not to have some experience in that part of the world. I went into a mall called the Carousel Mall Probably nine out of ten stores were closed. It was so abandoned, I felt like I was in a horror movie. Like that one Jack Nicholson was in. Uh, and, uh, nobody remembers that. Anyway, years ago. But uh, fiscal spending, serious infrastructure spending, uh, uh, I think those would go a long way towards creating jobs. Ridding ourselves of the psychology about austerity, forgetting that the deficit it could be a danger in the near term, which it's not, and dealing with it in the long term. Healthcare reform, we do have options. 
My, the one that's most often left out, and I think may be the most important, is that Wall Street had, an, uh, the way Wall Street worked, put enormous pressure on jobs because the stock market oversimplified, uh, rewarded ever-rising short-term profits. A lot of this had to do with leverage buyouts, with privatizations like Bain Capital, but with the general workings of the market. Jack Welch epitomized this. He took off his, at GE in 1980. <clears throat> he epitomized pressure, downward pressure on jobs and uh, labor markets. I think somehow we've got to begin to end that stranglehold that Wall Street has on jobs. Um, I think uh, in, in the global area, we've got to concentrate more on getting the value of the dollar down. And probably we do have to begin to think, and I hesitate to say this, about some protection of industries in a, in a bolder way. That's probably not the whole story, but uh, the final uh, part and the part I'd like to talk about at least is education, because it's the apple, it's the motherhood and apple pie of all economic uh, analysis. But the truth is we do have to educate people for a newer world, and we have to educate them equally. It's not that the quality of education in America is terrible, certainly across the board, it's that it's highly unequal many people get terrible educations. So I think there is an answer. Will we get there? The political situation looks like we won't. Make, makes it look like we won't. Yeah, we write the uh, tax code, get money from overseas into the US. Well, that would help. I think raising taxes on the wealthy would help progressive. We can raise progressive taxes enormously. My own, I, I, write, I should mention that I wrote a column for Harper's Magazine. I just started. and. Uh, uh, it's not on my biography. And I talk about how if we do write the economy, the most important thing we can do is start to raise taxes substantially. We can raise taxes on the top one or two percent of people to a serious tax rate. Why not 45 percent on a marginal basis? That would do a lot to raise taxes, getting it up that high, for example. But we should be raising taxes, frankly, on the middle income people as well after we correct the economy, not now. Clearly I answered everybody's questions. Wow, go have some fruit and some dessert. Uh, Sarah, did you want to say something about we discovering government? Yes. Um, just, we'll just take a moment. I just, actually, I have a question for you. What would you recommend the people in this room do? In what? What actions would you recommend the people here who are joining would take to make government better or rediscover government? Well, I would consider government as a career, which almost nobody does anymore. Um, uh, I think you can make it better from the inside. I think you can vote for the right people. I feel, I see a lot of those involved with Occupy Wall Street. A lot of those people have completely given up on government. I, many of them won't even vote in the presidential election. I would say vote, I would say organize, I would say fight for uh, some of these programs that are vital, it needn't be at a national level, maybe it shouldn't even be at a national level, maybe it should be at a local level. Little things matter. One of the things I learned from Ted Kennedy, I fight with my progressive friends about Obamacare all the time. They didn't have enough cost control, gave up the public option, gave pharmaceutical companies too much, uh, you, you gave them, uh, you allowed them to make too much profit, they should have spot, said no to power, that's the favorite phrase of the anti care people, no to power. But you know what, Senator Ken I did learn this from Senator Kennedy, he said, you're gonna help three million people, or 30 million people, as Obamacare may well, bring 30 million people into some, 37 million people, into some kind, <clears throat> I think it's 30 million out of 47, into some kind of health insurance plan. Think very carefully about criticizing that kind of program. 30 million lives. Each of those lives is important. So the lesson I would say to all of you here is three lives that are important. If you can devise some local government programs that help 50 lives, 100 lives, 5,000 lives, those are major contributions. And government can do that. Now business can do that too. Go into business and do some good with that business. But 300, 5,000, 10,000, you don't have to save 37 million. 
But let's not get cynical about it. our idealism. If we can help people, let's help them. And uh, every person help matters a lot. And government is, in my view, by and large, uh, the best way to do that. Good government. Jeff, can I ask you one quick question, too? Could you just talk a little bit about um, Obama's relationship to his economic advisors? In other words, are there are there no advisors who are pushing for a bigger stimulus or a Keynesian approach to the economy? Is he completely um, opposed yeah, to that approach? No, I, I, uh, I think he's a very cautious guy. What happened with Obama, the most important mistake that they made, you know, you keep hearing Governor Romney talk about, well, you said we were going to have, I don't remember, what did you was it 5.4% unemployment now? The forecast was way off, not because the recovery was badly uh, overestimated. That is the rate at which the GDP eventually expanded. But the depth of the recession was underestimated. When they made those forecasts in 2009, they underestimated how weak the economy was at that point. So we started from much lower. So the economic advisors blew that one. Now, I was upset from the beginning because he got all of Bill Clinton, basically Bill Clinton's economic advisors. For me, Obama was playing it safe, basically. He was saying, almost, you know, this may be a little bit harsh, so forgive me, but he was almost saying, I'm going to hide behind the fact, how can they blame me? I'm using the best democratic advisors around. When, I, when uh, George W. Bush was in office, Larry Summers was always the economist of choice in the Democratic Party. I was invited to a couple of, um, uh, more than a couple, but uh, you know, uh, uh, advisory sessions with Congress, with, with the Speaker of the House and uh, the Whip and you know, uh, 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 Frank. I keep thinking Frank's. First name is Dodd. Okay. <laughs> Barney Frank and so forth. Larry Summers was always there, and Larry Summers always dominated the discussion. And when Obama became president, who dominated the discussion? Larry Summers. And I think there were people like Christina Romer and eventually Summers who wanted more fiscal stimulus, but they didn't talk very loudly. And I think there's there's a guy named Rahm Emanuel. You've probably heard of him in Chicago. I think he tended to keep uh, a foot on the brake more than others. But we could talk about that for an hour. Yeah, but do, I mean, do you do you feel that if he is elected to a second term, there's any sense that he would change his team or move? I mean, I, I read something in the New York Review of Books that he essentially was relying on Tim Geithner, that that was really.